Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the May 20th meeting of the Evansville Astronomical Society. We're going to um, not have a business meeting tonight, instead jump right to a program, which is uh, by Chuck Allen. Uh, he, he put together the program uh, short, sort of on short notice. Uh, we had a cancellation and uh, he's, he's filling in for us. So we appreciate that a lot. And without further ado, we welcome uh, Astronomical League Vice President and Evansville Astronomical Society Program Chairman, Chuck Allen. To you, Chuck. Okay, again, I'm sorry for the repeat performance. Uh, uh, this is a tough time. A lot of the people I invite are giving final exams and uh, then they're traveling right after their final exams. So we've had a lot of cancellations and one because of a death in the family, not COVID related. <clears throat> um, what I'd like to talk about now, I'm gonna go ahead and share a screen. And let's see here. Okay, can you still hear me okay? Tony? Yes, just yeah. fine. Okay. Uh, what I want to talk about today is things to do this summer. Uh, and this is a little bit of astronomy for everybody, for people who are at an advanced level of observing, for people who are at a beginning level of observing, uh, things you might be interested in doing this summer uh, in astronomy. And we'll start with read and watch YouTubes. Now, I know that may sound silly, but uh, there's some interesting stuff out. Uh, this, uh, for many of you, uh, and I'm sure you've seen this face before if you're a member of the EAS, is Richard Gott. Richard is uh, Professor Emeritus of Astrophysics at Princeton University and <clears throat> an author of about six books. Most recently, um, he wrote a book uh, with three collaborators called uh, Welcome to the Universe in 3D. This is actually the third in a series of books. It started as a textbook for an introductory astronomy course at Princeton. Uh, then they wrote a brief uh, Welcome to the Universe, which was more public-minded. And now they have written one called Welcome to the Universe in 3D. It became a nationwide bestseller almost overnight and is almost sold out uh, from the Amazon supply. And they have 25,000 books in their supply. I'd like to show you a very brief part of a YouTube where Bob Vanderby, who was responsible for creating the 3D images uh, in collaboration with Richard and Neil deGrasse Tyson and Michael Strauss, who's now chairman of the Department of Astrophysics at Princeton. Uh, and I'm gonna start it at about two minutes and 42 seconds here. This is Bob Vanderby that you'll be Hold on just a minute. I don't think I started the share sound part of that. Okay, now let's try it again. Tell me, uh, thumbs up, Tony, if you can hear this. Pictures. Here's just a random page. Here's another random page. <laughs> Here's another one. And if we look at the other part, there's text describing what's on these random pages. But each page has two pictures, one for your left eye and one for your right eye. And then in the back of the book, or maybe I should show you what I just did. In the back of the book, you know, here's the back of the book. It has another, another panel that you can open up and then you can turn it like this. And I can put my eyes up to those. Those are two little lenses here. I can put my eyes up to that lens of my nose and that nose hole and look at the book like this. Now I can't see you and my, the lens makes my left eye see the left picture and my right eye see the right picture. And since those pictures are two different versions of the same picture, the left perspective and the right perspective, your brain says, oh, I see that, that's 3D. The things that are close look close, the things that are far look far, the things that are spheres look like spheres. And so um, so we thought it would be really fun to, to make um, a book that actually allows you to feel like immersed in this 3D uh, universe that we live in. <laughs> the so interesting thing here too, is you're not gonna lose those glasses. I mean, usually if you have 3D glasses, where'd I put them? Are they get 
costs somewhere. Exactly. This is built into the book, so it's always there. Yep, it's built in right there. You, they won't fall out. <laughs> so tell us about the 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 collaboration that went into this. You have some uh, some terrific co-authors here. Right. So um, so this book, by the way, is part of a series of books. Um, uh, okay, I'll stop there. Um, the book is. Uh, again, available on Amazon. I have a copy of it, and it's really quite excellent. And uh, let's see here. The co-authors who are... Sorry. Uh, the methods used in the book, by the way, uh, are rather interesting. They took a lot of Redshift data and used a computer to create the 3D images. So for example, in, in the case of the planets, however, what they would do is take two images of Mars and taken from Mars orbiters and uh, take them such that there was a 3.5 degree rotation in the planet as seen from the orbiter and put those two images on the page and then use the lens to uh, in the back of the book to combine them. And this gives you a stereoscopic view of Mars. Obviously Mars is far too far away as is the moon for our eyes, which are only three and a half inches apart or so to be able to see them stereoscopically. So what they have done is accommodated for that in all these images. Plus there's a lot of information about it, uh, each of the objects in the picture. And I, I highly recommend it to you. It's a neat little book. Uh, many of you remember back in October of 2011 that uh, we had a guest, a young man uh, named Scott Harrington from Evening Shade, Arkansas. He lives on a family farm with five siblings and his parents. Um, and started observing at the age of 14. And he came to Evansville to give a talk in September, I think actually of uh, 2019. And uh, at that point in time, he had published a lot of research online about the visibility of objects to the naked eye and then seven by uh, 35 binoculars. There's a lengthy uh, online document called 250 plus deep sky objects visible to the naked eye and with seven by 35 binoculars. Since then, he has advanced to 10, 16, and now even 36 inch telescopes at a nearby observatory to do his work. And uh, has now written uh, articles regularly for Sky and Telescope Magazine. Uh, in May of 2021, he published a, uh, a cover story on Sky and Telescope observed stellar nurseries and faraway galaxies. And in the May of 2022 Sky and Telescope that's just out, um, he has an article uh, concerning the uh, springboards uh, or springtimes rather neglected binocular galaxies. And so he's now on course to write a third article for s &T. So he is now a regular for s &T. So get out your May issues if you have them from last year and this year, and you can see some of Scott's work. Um, there's also been a new revolution in eyepieces. Uh, and this has to do with the use of night vision eyepieces, uh, one of which is pictured here on the left, uh, which is adapted to the use to use with teleview eyepieces. Now, this is fairly new. Uh, it's very expensive. The device, which is located right here, the night vision device is uh, runs over $4,000 and it's quite glonky. It puts a lot of strain on the diagonal of a telescope, as you can imagine. And it is also adaptable to smartphones if you want to do that, or you can observe visually with these. If you are interested in that at all, there is an excellent YouTube that was just posted on the 17th of May. The name of the YouTube is ASEM Digital SIG, May 17th, 2022. It's a presentation by Jeff Corder. It's very thorough, about an hour and 45 minutes, and it was sponsored by the Astronomical League uh, uh, through one of our national coordinators. Uh, so if you are interested in exploring this or learning more about it, you might want to check out that YouTube. And if you don't write that down and want it later, just email me and I'll get it to you. Um, <clears throat> I will point out <clears throat> that on the Teleview site, they mention that you under no circumstances can export uh, this night vision device to any other country. 
And it is even illegal, if you can believe it, to let a non-US citizen look through it in the United States. <laughs> so prepare to ask for passports if you, uh, if you decide to use this device at all. Uh, a second thing you might wanna do this summer is watch for a possible Tau Herculid meteor storm. Now, what's this about? Well, uh, some years ago in 1930, a comet was discovered uh, that passed within 6 million miles of the earth, very close to the earth. And then it disappeared for decades, but it was reacquired later. And in 1995, comet uh, 76P Schwassmann Wachmann III started to fracture, it fractured into four parts. Um, so what we have here is a disintegrating comet that is in an orbit that passes close to Earth. And that is the formula for some excitement if you're a meteor storm lover. Uh, now, normally the Tau Herculids, would, which are caused by the trail of the original non-fractured comet would be in the range of 10 to 18 um, uh, hours per, or, or meteors per hour, the zenithal rate of uh, 10 to 18. Uh, meteors. But since it has fractured and left obviously a lot more material in its wake, there could possibly be a storm. And here's a landed storm image taken uh, at 38,000 feet uh, by NASA back in November of 1999. There's no guarantee that this will happen, but it could. So if you're interested in pursuing that, here's where the radiant is. It's around the star Tau. Hercules. Um, the meteors, of course, can appear anywhere in the sky radiating from that point. These will be exceptionally slow meteors. The meteors are catching up with the Earth from behind. So whereas the Leonids were entering the atmosphere at 100 kilometers per second, these would be entering the Earth's atmosphere at about 16 kilometers per second, the slowest of any meteors in the sky during the course of the year, any shower. So you might want to check it out. Um, the possibility uh, of this storm occurring will be in the wee hours of May 31st. So that's the night of May 30th, the morning of May 31st, after midnight, preferably after 1 a.m., uh, radiating from Hercules. So you might want to check it out just in case a storm occurs. There's no guarantee of it. It's just a thought. Another thing you might want to do is pursue one of the league's observing programs. I'm not on commission and we don't get paid for this, but I'm telling you these are interesting programs that are available to people regardless of what kind of equipment you may have or not have. The top line that you see here are all observing programs that can be done without observing at all uh, or done naked eye. Uh, they include constellation, sketching, analemma, meteor observing, dark sky advocate, uh, outreach, public outreach, and uh, orbiting satellite observations. The second row is a series of binocular programs. If you've got a pair of binoculars, you're set. You can do double stars, messiers, uh, deep sky objects, variable stars, and so forth. And the third line down here are all programs that can be done with very small telescopes. Three inch aperture would be fine for doing most of them. Uh, the more the merrier, obviously, <clears throat> and three inches might be a little difficult on some of the lunar targets, and certainly in lunar two, you'd need some more aperture. The double stars are pretty accessible. Um, the comet observing can be, depends on how fast you want to get through it. A lot of comets are faint. You need big aperture, 10, 12 inches for some of them when they're only reaching 12th magnitude or so. Uh, so if you want to do the comets at a more rapid pace, a uh, larger aperture would help there. But these programs are available. The sun's very active now. We have an expert in our midst, uh, Mike Borman, of course, whose uh, solar photography has been internationally published. Um, <clears throat> we've been through a solar minimum for the last couple of years, but this was, I think, yesterday's image of the sun, and it's quite active. So if you're interested in doing sunspotter work, you just need a small telescope and a white light filter, and you can get started on that. If you're a lunar observer, this gives you something to do when the moon's out and deep sky observing is not an option. And the variable star program for binoculars is also something that's very accessible to people who are starting out. 
you just need a chart like this uh, that will help you locate uh, a particular target. This one's for telescopes. This is not a binocular chart. Um, but you can go to the AABSO page. You do not need to be a member and click on binocular and then down here, print binocular charts now. And they have a list of binocular uh, variable stars that you can search for and print charts for. And then all you need is to go out in the field uh, to do this work is the chart, uh, a star chart, some binoculars, a red light and a camp chair. And you can do it from fairly suburban areas. This is a typical binocular chart that you see here. Here's the variable star involved. Here's a very bright uh, star, fifth magnitude star. And this little blue disc is roughly the size of a binocular field. So you can kind of get a feel for what it will be like to search for the uh, star once you find, say, these three stars here. It's kind of fun and it's a direct contribution to science. Uh, these estimates go into a database that create light curves for all of these stars. And uh, so it's your way of contributing uh, directly to science. Um, this would be a good year, if you haven't ever done it before, to observe Pluto. Um, I first did this in 1990 after spending about four hours making charts, reversing the charts and creating eyepiece, eyepiece templates for them to create a star hop from an eighth magnitude star to Pluto. When Pluto is near an eighth magnitude star, it's very easy to find if you have a sufficient aperture to see it. Uh, that's happened twice in my life, once actually at Potoka Lake and once uh, at a Boy Scout reservation uh, when we were doing a merit badge program. Pluto um, uh, can be seen here. Obviously, it's not very bright compared to surrounding stars, and it's gotten a lot fainter in recent years. This is where Pluto is located right now. It's near Pi Sagittarii. Uh, in the so-called little milk dipper, which is marked by these little green lines here. So being near a bright star like Pi makes this very accessible because Pluto is magnitude 14.3 now. It was 13.7 when I observed it with a 10 inch telescope on two successive nights and I could detect its motion between those nights. The only real way to confirm that you're seeing it actually, um, but it will be near Pi this is its track during the latter part of June. You see how close it is to pi. So you have to work, let's say you wanna find Pluto on the 27th at zero hours UT. You have to find it a little later than that actually, uh, after it gets dark. You'd be looking for these two little stars here and then look for Pluto right above it. Uh, something that you might wanna to try to do if you haven't because it will be a lot easier now. Pluto is starting to get out of the range of the Milky Way now, less competition in the field of view for the star. In the sky.org has excellent charts uh, that will show in a given period of time uh, where Pluto is located in the field. So you might wanna uh, check that out if you're gonna go into the field and do this. I do encourage you though, when you make these charts, if you're using an SCT, uh, you're gonna need to reverse the charts. Uh, horizontally. And then you should make templates, cut out circles that will show you precisely what area of the field of view you're looking at. It will help you enormously. And then when you get the field where Pluto is located, you will want to slide that eyepiece out and slide in a higher power eyepiece to darken the background sky and help Pluto pop out. At plus 14.3, it's going to be right at the edge of visibility on a good dark night in a, in a 10 or 12 inch and uh, 20 inch or 18, 16 would be better. Another thing you might wanna consider doing this summer is go to our Astronomical League National Convention in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, it's being held at the embassy suites and the room rates there are extraordinary. They're, the block room rates are about $126. Uh, that's about half of what you pay for nice hotel rooms anymore. Uh, especially with inflation and the room rate is locked in. Uh, in five days, the registration rate goes up a little bit for this convention. So if you're gonna register, you might wanna do it now. Uh, one opportunity you will have at this convention is to meet Senator Harrison Schmidt. 
uh, former senator, uh, who of course was aboard Apollo 17 as a geologist, the last mission to land on the moon. Uh, you have the opportunity to attend uh, for a fee the VIP reception for him. You can get a book and an autograph and a photo. And you can also attend a dinner and a lecture by him about his experiences on the moon. Uh, should be pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, you're going to get a dose of New Mexican food uh, at the banquet. Uh, I understand it's extraordinary. And then a possible, or not a possible, but a scheduled trip to the General Nathan Twining Observatory. They have a 16 inch reflector there, F6. They'll have other telescopes set up, and this is at a dark sky site. Uh, this is the grounds of the site to give you an idea, um, uh, south of Albuquerque. Uh, <clears throat> there will be another trip available <clears throat> on Sunday, and that is a bus trip to the very large array. Now, what's important to understand is the VLA is now closed to the public. How long that will be, I don't know, but it's closed to the public and the only way in is through our tour. So from this convention, if you sign up for the tour, you go there on a bus and you can opt uh, after spending the day at the VLA to then go to Magdalena, New Mexico and visit the incredible antique telescope museum maintained by John Briggs in Magdalena. That will be accompanied by observing as well. Uh, John is going to be a speaker with us. Um, he has some connection problems, it's so remote there in Magdalena, but I'm going to try to have him talk about his setting up of telescopes, both in Magdalena and at the South Pole Station, of all places. Really exciting stuff. Here's a, another view of some of the antique telescopes that he has in an old gymnasium there uh, in Magdalena. Be very interesting. <clears throat> One thing you might want to learn to do, uh, which this young man has done, is learn to use your smartphone uh, for pursuing astronomy. Smartphones, especially with the new night vision options, are incredible devices for taking nice photographs of constellations, zodiacal light, other phenomena in the sky. Uh, this is Connell Richards. He won the league's uh, highest service award last year, the Horkheimer Smith Award and is now studying aeronautical engineering at Penn State University. And he's a regular with us on uh, Global Star Parties. He took this picture with a smartphone during the eclipse, uh, caught an extraordinary image of the moon um, to show you the kinds of things that you can do with, with no telescope at all, but just your, just your uh, smartphone. He took another photograph during the eclipse that actually picked up, and I think you can sort of see it on the limb of the moon there, and I'll enlarge it a little bit, he picked up an occultation during the course of the eclipse. Uh, one that he wasn't expecting until he noticed it on the images. Another thing you might want to do this summer is observe the Delta Aquarius meteor shower. This is the only summer and early fall meteor shower that will not be badly affected by the moon. Um, the Delta Aquarius uh, can reach 20 uh, kilometers, uh, or 20 uh, meteors per hour, rather. And the peak will occur at 1 a.m., roughly after 1 a.m. on the date that you see there. The radiant, of course, is in southern Aquarius. So many of the meteors will disappear below the horizon to the south but others to the north will be readily available to you. The Perseids this year will be wiped out by the moon, almost, almost at full moon this year. So the morning of July 30th, good time to, uh, or 29th, either one, be good nights to observe this. Another thing you might want to do this summer is go for distance. Um, Many of you have seen programs that I've given recently about some of the furthest things that we've ever detected in the universe. Here is GNZ 11 and Ursa Major, which has for a number of months been the most distant confirmed object ever uh, imaged in our universe. It has a light travel distance of 13.4 billion light years. It's just a little tiny red dot buried in the middle of this crosshair, enlarged to this heavily pixelated image here. Its current distance today is 32 billion light years. 
And because of that distance and the expansion of the universe, it's actually being separated from us currently at more than twice the speed of light. Uh, however, last month in April, uh, some astronomers in Japan detected something even further. It's called HD1 in sextants, the south of Leo. It has a light travel distance of 13.5 billion light years and a current distance of 33 billion light years distance. Now, these both of these objects, as you've noticed, are heavily reddened. They're not heavily reddened. You're seeing these objects as they were when they were little tiny proto galaxies full of brand spanking new blue white stars. But the light has been stretched uh, over 13 times uh, as it has passed in, this, in the case of HD1, as it has passed through expanding space for nearly the entire age of the universe. The universe is estimated to be 13.8 billion years old. This light's been traveling to us for 13.5 billion of those years. Uh, now you can't observe these things without the Hubble Space Telescope. And these things will be the targets of the James Webb Space Telescope, which is why it has that gold mirror. Uh, that mirror is intended to be highly sensitive to infrared radiation and will study these little proto galaxies as we look back in time. We won't find things in the universe that are much further back in time than GNZ11 or HD1, because you're looking back into an era that's so early that stars hadn't even formed yet, much less glommed together to form little proto galaxies that would later form mature galaxies. Nonetheless, there are some pretty distant things that you can go for as an amateur astronomer, and they are prodigiously distant. One thing you might want to try to do this summer, if you have a nice dark sky available, is try to see the furthest star that's visible to the naked eye. It's V762 Cassiopeia, it's magnitude plus 5.8, that's gonna be a test, you need a good night, but it lies at 16,308 light years, parallax determined distance. Give it a shot. It's the furthest star that can be seen with the unaided eye, barring uh, a supernova in another galaxy like Andromeda that might rise to magnitude five, but the last time that happened was 1885, so don't hold your breath. One thing you can do very easily with small telescopes, uh, even an eight inch potentially or a 10 inch, depending on the quality of your skies, is go for Quasar 3C273 in Virgo. It's magnitude plus 12.9. It's just a star-like image. And it lies at 2.44 billion light years. For most amateur astronomers, this is the furthest thing that they have ever seen uh, through a telescope. For most professional astronomers, uh, it would be the furthest thing they've ever seen through a telescope. It's very easy to find once you locate this little V formation that you see here. And there are two stars in one side of the V and the outer one is 3C273. If you have a large telescope, a 20 inch or larger, and you're in extremely dark skies, you can try for what's considered to be the hardest galaxy cluster for amateurs to observe. And that is a Bell 2065. It's magnitude plus 16, and it lies at a distance of 900 million light years. It's a toughie. It's in Corona Borealis. Another thing that you can try that you can do surprisingly with a much smaller telescope, even a 10 inch can do it, uh, perhaps an eight inch under exceptional skies, is look for NGC 4319, it's a galaxy that lies at a distance of 80 million light years. It's about magnitude plus 11.9. And right next to it is a faint 14th magnitude apparent star uh, that the arrow is pointing to here. But that object is actually 14 times further away from us than the galaxy is. It is Markarian 205. It lies at a distance of 1 billion light years um, and is the subject or was the subject of a controversy because some astronomers uh, did some imaging that concluded uh, that there was some sort of a gas stream that connected the quasar with the galaxy, which of course would be totally impossible if these were indeed uh, that far apart, more than 900 million light years apart. Nonetheless, uh, it is now fairly settled that this actually is a quasar that lies at a very great distance that we are simply seeing through the halo of this foreground galaxy. Again, uh, 1 billion light years, 
readily available to anyone with an eight or 10 inch telescope. Since many of our club members have 20 inch telescopes, one thing that is entirely within reach uh, is a quasar that lies, if you can believe it, at a distance of 12 billion light years. Again, the universe is 13.8 billion years old. This light's been traveling to us for 12 billion light years. Its current location is 23 billion light years away. Now to find it, you're gonna need a telescope capable of seeing a reddened object at magnitude plus 15.2. That's going to take at least a 20 inch telescope on a very good night. And once you, uh, this is an image of, of the quasar uh, APM, it is lensed. The light from this quasar is being bent around a foreground galaxy cluster, which is why we see two images of it here. Uh, it's a really interesting object. Um, not only is its distance currently in almost 24 billion light years, but the black hole at the center of this quasar that's causing all of this energetic output because of inflowing material has a mass of 20 billion suns and an energy output of one quadrillion suns. Uh, also, this quasar is heavily laden with water vapor. Um, in fact, it has 34 billion Earth masses of water vapor connected with it. It's the largest reservoir of water ever detected in the universe. Um, Finding it requires finding a little funny triangular object right here. These are faint stars. But once you find them, you look for a triangle here, a triangle here, and then three stars, or at least two, and then up to the quasar, which is right here. It would be a hunt. It is possible with a 20 inch. I know people who've done it with a 20 inch. And I guarantee you, if you see this object, you can safely conclude that you have seen the furthest possible thing that anyone, anywhere, professional or amateur, has ever seen live through a telescope. Um, that is just almost a given at 12 billion light years of light travel time. Another thing you might wanna do this summer, you have a unique opportunity to observe a double shadow transit uh, of two moons casting shadows on Jupiter at the same time. This is what one looks like taken from space, but I'm going to show you what you will be able to observe uh, this summer. On July 16th, just after midnight, this will be the configuration. And this is central daylight time. This will be the configuration. Ganymede down here will be casting a shadow on Jupiter. Io will be transiting and also casting a shadow transit on Jupiter and the great red spot will be in between. Now, if you're a planetary photographer, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. It's a great, great image or just fun to observe. So you might wanna give it a shot. Again, this is the night of July 15th. Uh, you'll wanna get started at about 10 p.m. And shortly after midnight, the configuration should be very similar to this. The night of the 15th, early morning of the 16th, right around midnight. Uh, another thing you might want to do this summer, uh, in conclusion, is to observe zodiacal light. I don't know how many of you have done that. Um, I, I never really focused on it too much until I had a, an experience back in uh, March of this year. I was up at the Toka Lake, where I go quite often, and uh, I noticed that I was having trouble observing things in the constellation of Pisces. I was looking for, for galaxies and I thought, well, Jasper's awfully bright tonight because I was looking toward the West. And then, and I just did this rough sketch. I noticed that there was a column of light that was rising all the way out of Aquarius, Pisces and into Aries like this, a dome of light. And I realized suddenly that I was competing with springtime Western sky zodiacal light. The zodiacal light rises very steeply off the horizon and is more visible uh, in the western sky after sunset in the spring or in the fall in the east before sunrise. That's when the zodiac, the ecliptic, rises very steeply off the horizon. And this zodiacal light was actually so intense that it was interfering with my observing. It was removing contrast from images. I was searching for some pretty faint stuff. Um, the zodiacal light can be seen here in this image taken by uh, uh, the, an ESO astronomer down in Chile. 
um, what you can see here is basically the dust in the plane of the Milky Way. This is along the ecliptic the plane of the Milky Way, which is tilted to the plane of the galaxy. And the zodiacal light can be seen very brightly here because this image was taken probably just after sunset and the sun was over here on the right side of the image. Um, this will be a good opportunity to observe the zodiacal light at 5.30 a.m. Central Time on September 27th. There will be no moon. Uh, the zodiacal light will be rising very steeply. Uh, here you see the constellation of Leo, time quarters here, Regulus here, and you can see faintly the dome of light rising at an angle to the Milky Way uh, on that morning. So if you've never seen the zodiacal light, this may be a great opportunity for you to do that. So those are a few things to do this summer if you haven't decided what you're going to be doing. Uh, and if any of those hold any interest to you, whether you're a beginner or an advanced astronomer, I would suggest you go for it. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. That was very interesting, Chuck. Thank you. Um, I'm sure there's going to be a question of, is there a possibility that we could, um, you could send to me your, your PowerPoint or a PDF where everyone can reference uh, your, your slides when they you know, go through some of these challenge objects and, and things that you pointed out? Sure. Okay. I'll do that and I'll uh, see if we can make it available on either the website or by request uh, by sending an email to uh, evansvilleastro at gmail.com. I could write it up too, if that would make it easier for you to post. Especially the the ob the observations that come at specific times, like the the double shadow transit, the uh, potential tau herculid uh, meteor shower, that sort of thing. That's particularly interesting. That meteor shower. It could be a total bust. There could be nothing at all. But with the comet breaking up in 1995 and its orbit coming so close to Earth, there's every possibility it could be a brief but very interesting meteor shower. It might be something to, to consider, you know, uh, carving out an evening, because just in tape case. Yeah. I mean, these things are basically, some of them are once in a lifetime opportunities. So, you know, to miss a, a, a storm, meteor storm, which I've never seen would be, and I'm 60, uh, no, I'm 40 years old and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so I can't miss too many of more of them. Yeah, there's a, a <clears throat> this uh, current May issue of Sky and Telescope contains an article about this very comet and the possibility of a meteor storm. So if you're interested in more information about that um, and, or in reading uh, Scott Harrington's article on neglected binocular galaxies, uh, this is the issue you want to check. It, it has a, a great deal about the uh, potential meteor shower. Anyone else? Mitch, you unmuted. Obviously, I didn't go observing tonight. For those of you who are surprised to see me, Not surprised with the weather. It's it's the wind, you know. The our big dobs, you know, they're just like sails. Yeah. I have a story to, to share that uh, Scott was involved with uh, several years ago when he and I were out at Okie Tex. We had set up on the observing field um, on the 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 south side. We normally set up quite very near. To where the uh, um, uh, shel shelter house and cafe is. So, at any rate, it's 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 an area that's not uh, in any way concealed or blocked, wind blocked. And uh, he had his his, his uh, dob out there, and luckily he had the servo cat on it. And it was just. It, you know, we'd, we'd slew to an object or whatever, and the servo cat was just vibrating to keep the scope 
uh, position. And actually, you didn't have to use averted vision because <laughs> because yeah. it kept yeah. moving so much that you could uh, you could see some things normal you couldn't see uh, without without moving your eye around the eyepiece. So it was actually a pretty interesting. I don't know if I you know told the story very well, but it was it was pretty cool nonetheless. So wind can be your friend. <laughs> Ken, where are you? You're outdoors. Yes, I'm sitting out back on the swing. Oh. <laughs> it's a little windy. <laughs> Mike's Mike's over by the sun, so it's probably a little hot for him. Yeah, it's kind of warm in here. <laughs> Mike, I hope you've got sunscreen on the back of your head, the back of your neck. You're the one that always gets the sunburn. Uh, on, on astronomy day. Yeah, my bald spot's getting toasty. <laughs> That's my whole head anymore. <laughs> Am I correct that there is no picnic next month? You are you are not correct. Uh, okay. As far as I know, we'll, we're going to be having a picnic. Um, so just keep your keep your ears and eyes open for, for details. So far, we've, we've planned it to be at Ken's. Uh, and I'm, I'm assuming that's still a good plan, Ken? Oh, yeah. Yeah, fine here. OK. And uh, for those that haven't been out to Ken's place, it's quite a drive, uh, for, well, for me at least, because I'm way on the, on the other side of Evansville in Jasper. But so so has, am I. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, double, put an hour and a half onto that. So, but you can stay over if you want at my place. And at your place. Yeah, at my house. So, um, so Ken has some very, very good skies. He has a really nice horizon. You can see down low if you need to. Um, and uh, Mitchell, Mitchell chime in as well. But once we were out at, at his place and we had some planetary views that were just to die for. I've never, you know, I've never seen such good planetary views as from his house that evening. I know you brought up the 28. I don't know if it was that year or we were just looking through. I don't remember which scopes we had out there, but um, in any scope, it was it was just excellent view. It was a good night. Yes. Now, if we come to the picnic, do we get a chance to sit on your swing? When I'm not in it. <laughs> and Tony, may I assume that we're not announcing the date due to the venue here? Correct. Okay. So that's a that's a for anyone that's not a a paid a dues paying member of the Evansville Astronomical Society. So we have to do, if you're a member of our face group, uh, Facebook group. So that's just our social outreach. Uh, and there is another level of membership in the EAS, which is a, a dues paying member. This, this observation at Ken's house is actually for uh, uh, paid, paid members of the uh, Evansville Astronomical Society. So if you're a member, you'll, you'll learn about it. One of the, one of the many benefits of becoming a member is driving to the undisclosed location of our picnic <laughs> and complaining with Ken about the quality of the road on the uh, on the way there. I just got him graded today. <laughs> so I guess we we shouldn't complain. Oh no, you can still complain. <laughs> well, good good for you. They're they're just better than they were. I hope that's not a skunk. <laughs> my my dog has spotted something going across the field and is halfway there. <laughs> Could be a bobcat. It, it takes a while to get the, the skunk smell off a dog. I can tell you that. Uh, there's a product called D-Skunk. It's sold at Walmart and it works. Really? 
affect yes. that, that easily? Yes, you have to shampoo them. I shampooed her twice last time this happened about three years ago, and she didn't stink. Wow. Is the dog still alive after you apply it? Hydrofluoric <laughs> <laughs> it acid shampoo, yeah. Something about high acid content, but it works. There's if not kid, much hair left. <laughs> the real test would be to shampoo a skunk with the product and then give us a report. <laughs> uh, they're hard to catch. I, I ran over a dead skunk. Uh, on the way Whoa. back from Patoka one night, and my car stunk for two days. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it just caught, it was already dead, but it went under the tire and must have hit underneath the car. It was awful. Um, well, I'm glad to say my dog did not catch whatever that was. Yeah. <laughs> but she is still looking for it. Okay, well, I'm going to go outside and look and see if I made a mistake by not taking my telescope out. And I'll see you all later. Thank all you, right. Mitch. See ya. See you, Mitch. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and, and pause, the, stop the recording here. Okay.